On this week's episode, I'm joined by Sofia Noronha, founder and producer of Sages Productions and responsible for bringing some hit shows to Portugal, like Fast and the Furious franchise and the House of Dragons. At the time of recording, Sofia was very pregnant and about to have a baby, and we discuss, amongst other things, the untapped cinematic potential in Portugal, what she loves about her country, the incredible Monsanto castle where they filmed House of Dragons, and we discuss loopholes in the baby naming process in Portugal. For those of you listening, head over to our YouTube channel to see some of the photos that we published during this episode. And for those of you watching, click down below and subscribe. And now, over to my conversation with Sofia Noronha. Welcome back, or welcome to another episode of Portugal The Simple Life. And I'm really excited to be joined here by Sofia Noronha. Sofia, hello, and hello, welcome hello. to the podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. You're very, you're very welcome. Thank you. Uh, you are very pregnant right now. So we had a time crunch. We needed to record this by before next week. Correct. It's a week away. So I think I'll be a total different person. I'll become a mom. So that's going to Amazing. change a lot. So Amazing. I'm happy we're doing this before. Me too. Me too. Otherwise I had to wait till like he was walking again and going to school. I don't look like a Who dog. knows? Who knows how long it could take? Yeah, you'd look more like a zombie after afterwards. Not not so much now. Exactly. Are we allowed to say what his name is going to be? Yes, it's going to be Oliver. Oliver. Okay. Oliver. So how would that translate into Portuguese? Olivier. Oliver. 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 It doesn't. It doesn't really exist the name in Portuguese. That's but right. But I think it's a very international name, so it it goes on to almost every language. It says the same, apart from the French. They'd like to Olivier put it a little bit Olivier. more. Olivier. Yeah, um, my my boy's name's Benjamin, but I was able to call him Benjamin and not Benjamin with the M okay. at the end because because I'm foreign and my wife's Portuguese, so we got to be able to oh, name him Benjamin like with the N. Oh, it's good to know because also my partner is a foreigner, is German, so it's good to know that with go. that option I can put a non-Portuguese name. <laughs> yeah, you can Thank do just Oliver. So there you go. You learn something new. Yeah, there you should go. we should we end the podcast now? Exactly. Just... So it was already worth it. It was a doubt I had, and then <laughs> wonderful. I'm so happy wonderful. you clarify it for me. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. I'm here for these kind of things, you know. Um, <laughs> Sophia, maybe you can tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Um, I don't know really what's interesting about it, apart from that I'm pregnant. That's the one thing I can think about now. But I guess it's the reason why you call me here. It's what I do for a, for a living. And it's something that I actually, I'm very proud that I do something that I love because without loving your profession in this industry, I don't think you'd be able to, to go to the end of the day. It's very intense. So I'm a, I'm a film producer and that includes series, films, documentaries, all sorts of um, format for content. But in the last couple of years, I created my own uh, production company called Sages Productions, which is actually a French name, but it translates into Italian, into Latin, into Greek. It's called, it's, it's, it means uh, wisdom. So Sages cool. comes from Sage, from the wise. Sage. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And uh, my grandfather used to call me that when I was small because Sophia also means wisdom. Okay. So he used to call me Sages, come here. So I'd come. And that's the name of the company. Oh, and geez. since then, we've been um, producing a lot of things, a lot of very exciting things for Portugal. Um, I work between Portugal and Spain. But the last couple of years, we've been doing the House of Dragons, the first season, and the Fast and Furious, which we just finished. Fast and Furious 10, which is interesting to know. This is already on 10. Yes. My goodness. <laughs> I love I love the, the reaction. Most of the people are like, what? It's already 10. Correct. That makes me feel old. Well, I think they are just, it is just successful. So they keep on doing, but they're going to just do one more and then it's over. Are we allowed then, to say that? Are we allowed to talk about that here? That it's the... Yes. Yes. Okay, so this is the second last one. Correct. And, and it's, it's kind done. of a... Um, um, the first part of the end. So the oh. second one will be a continuation of this one. And okay. then it's final. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll get on to your work. Um, 
tell us a little bit about your hometown, where you born and raised, and uh, what do you like about it? I'm I'm totally Portuguese. You know, nowadays everyone is a bit of this and that. And I, my mom is this, my, I'm like, no, I'm fully, fully Portuguese. <laughs> Couldn't be more. But but also I've always had this, this feeling of traveling around the world. So I feel that being a Portuguese, born and raised in Lisbon, um, somehow it feels that we Portuguese have also this desire of traveling around the world and discovering other, other lands. So it's um, the fact that we are right at the corner and then it's just sea and you know the history of people traveling and going out on the sea. I, I feel that I have that. So I've been traveling all my life. I lived in London for seven years, mm. in Los Angeles, in Madrid, in uh, Tenerife, I've been living around, but somehow always coming back to Portugal and, and always selling my country as very proud as all the Portuguese are, I'm sure you know, because you've been living here for a while. But the fact that we are not, we don't brag so much like other cultures do, like the Latins, you know, they love the Italians or the French, they love bragging about. We are not like that, but deep down, down, we are the proudest, you know, <laughs> we're like, hey, Portuguese is the best. But, but yes, yeah, yeah. so fully born and raised and in Portugal. We're, we're allowed to say bad things about Portugal, but nobody else is. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. It's the strongest what- characteristic. What do you, I mean, Lisbon, you know, we're going now 10 years now, Lisbon's really on the world stage, world travel awards and well-known amongst and digital nomad location and startup capital of the world and all these things. Um, what do you want people to know about your city? Well, to begin with, we are, I think the one thing we haven't lost, and it's it's funny to have all these international friends visiting me and, and all my all my clients coming to Portugal, the one thing we haven't lost is this, uh, the welcoming feeling. We, I think we're always very welcoming and always very uh, open to receiving visitors. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's the one thing that I feel that anyone that comes to visit Lisbon or Portugal feels, regardless of the amount of tourism. And I, I'm very proud of saying that because after so much tourism, cities tend to become bitter and somehow Lisbon still manages to have a gentle part of it, keeping their culture and keeping that, you know, Portuguese sense. But apart from that, it's it's still, we're still a small city. So you always feel, you know, you, you always feel part of something. It's not like when you arrive in a major capital, you're like a bit lost and you don't, you know, you don't feel at home. And I feel that, that in my city, at least I can say that, that you'll always feel at home. Mm. Yeah, I think that's true. I think that's true. The food's still good. Food's still good. I mean, prices, you can start complaining about them because it wasn't like that 10 years ago, I can guarantee you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But still, again, still more affordable than other cities because we can't avoid this um, globalization that is happening. People are traveling and, and the flights are cheap. So everyone goes anywhere they want. So it's, it's difficult to maintain a level of um, affordability for the locals, you know, to go out, to go to restaurants. But I think it's still, we're still okay for now. A little bit more and we won't anymore. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think correct me if I'm wrong, but I think well, like one of the things that I've, that I mean, you'll have to look a little bit harder than normal now, in Lisbon, but you still find those little tushkas and those little, snack bars and cafes where you can still have a nice pitok and a nice grilled fish and it's not going to and it's going to be 10 euros or in some cases even eight and that's rare uh you don't have that in any of the other capitals um which i hope it still stays and i think it will because i think if it had been gone completely would have happened already um (laughs) so so it's still it's still good um what do you love the most about i mean how about well actually how about as a as a soon-to-be mom uh, Lisbon for for children. It's uh, it's a great city for kids. I think. I mean, another another thing that we can be proud of is the quality of life. That's the one thing that you still have. It's still so safe. You have the sun. I don't want to be so cliche in saying the things that everyone mentions, but it's a reality. You know, it's yeah. even if you go, for example, I lived in LA, and you think, wow, the sun is beautiful, the beach are amazing. 
you still have an amazing offer of food, but everything is so expensive. I mean, healthcare is so difficult. You're always concerned. So when you when you have kids here, for example, you know that they will be in a safe environment. You know that anything that happens, the hospitals will treat them well. Uh, they, they get to know the neighbors still, you know, it's still, you know, a community within a city full of variety. So that's the one thing yeah. that you cannot buy and that money doesn't buy. And yeah. independently of if Portugal is not the biggest economy, which we know, and, and, and there's a lot of things that we still have to, to develop. I think the quality of life pays off all the things that we're lacking. So it's yeah. a good balance. Certainly, yeah. Um, how did you how did you get into the work that you're in today? Oof, I, I don't know myself without it. Actually, <laughs> I think that really describes um, describes me. And to to begin with, I'm a Capricorn, so I'm a workaholic. <laughs> I love working. <laughs> I love. Um, trying to discover discover new challenges and trying to make it happen. So that, that really, I would say, classifies me. I like to make it happen. And I started as an actress. Uh, my, my grandma used to write plays. And, and again, very Portuguese kind of families, loads of kids, loads of cousins. I had 36 on one side and 18 on the other. Wow, and, you know our Christmases were always crazy and holidays and everything, and she loved having people around. So she would write these plays and make sure that we memorize all the lines, and then she would make costumes for all of us. We had a, a streamstress, seamstress, seamstress, yeah, um, that would sew all our costumes, but we had to memorize the lines, and otherwise, you know, we we would be in big trouble with her. So that starts that passion for that world of the industry of entertainment started there. And then later on, I went on to acting school when I was 15. And, you know, like many other actors and actresses, they end up discovering other parts of the industry, which is not necessarily being on the other side of the cameras, because sometimes that's the glamour that you see as an actor is not so much what happens in reality. There's a lot of waiting, there's a lot of no's, a lot of auditions, a lot of, you have to change, you're too tall, you're too big, you're too fat. I mean, so many uh, um, waiting and waiting for something to happen in your in your career that that didn't definitely combine with me. I'm like waiting, I don't, I cannot wait. So I start producing my own plays when I left drama school and in London, and you know, London is crazy. London, everything happens. You meet so many cool people and fringe theaters and amazing directors, even without money or just just for the projects, for the passion of the project, that um, I start producing my own plays. And that's when I realized that pr production is much more what I do, you know, make it happen, put together a lot of elements and then come up with something creative. And that's where I started. I went to university to study production for film and TV. And then since then, it's been a nonstop. <laughs> so you took off to your gran. <clears throat> it's you took off to your gran producing. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> totally. What, what was your favorite role that you that you played for one of your grandmother's plays? Can you for remember? Me, I, I remember as, as in for my grandmas, I remember one that. We had all the girls, so the, the, the same cousins with the same age, they were Spice Girls. But because I was the youngest, I didn't have a role as a Spice Girl and I was so sad. So she made me the posh girl. And the posh girl was someone that would come after the Spice Girls have acted. I would destroy, come in the middle and say, who are these girls? They are ridiculous, like uh, shaking their asses and showing their tummy because, of course, my grandma is super conservative would put a bit of that side so it was like a little bit of the and, and I think I was like six or seven but I memorized the whole speech I had to do and that was a good start good start yeah amazing amazing <laughs> uh, for, for, from a from I mean even though production is more sort of behind the scenes and things like that but I mean from your perspective I mean Portugal is such a like a cinematographic place. I mean, it's just so beautiful, and there's so much. I mean, landscape and history and buildings and castles. 
how did that inspire you to to get into the the industry well exactly i mean i think you i think you're talking on a key factor precisely what made me stay in portugal in 2016 because i've i've been for 7 years in london and i i produced a musical about fado in london called once mm -hmm. in fado in village underground i don't know if you know the place mm -hmm. but it was like an immersive experience about portugal because i thought that out there people didn't know so much about portugal and i always wanted to sell portugal out there so that went really well. So I came to Portugal to continue to produce to Luxembourg and to Brussels and to France. So we had meetings already happening and I got back to Portugal and I'm like, why am I not here? You know, I, that there isn't enough productions happening here, international productions with the landscape we have and all the factors that really attract people to go to an, any other country, you know, to Spain, to Italy, to France. And Portugal is, is slightly behind in the sense of in the industry. And so it was precisely that year that I start really trying to sell Portugal as much as Portugal, Portugal being here. And that includes all the locations, you know, it's, um, it's so unexplored still and so much to show yeah. that um, it, that's what makes my job exciting. Yeah, I mean, it is quite a shame that we don't see more of these amazing landscapes and monuments and cities and towns on a on the big screen. You know, um, it's crazy. You see Paris all the time. You see Brussels and and, and Amsterdam and, and all these. And and here you're sitting with Portugal, which has got so much as well. Correct. Not to say that it's better, but it is. It's better. Don't it's better. <laughs> I don't but, um, um, yeah, I mean, look, I love, I love that you wanted to show more. I'd, I'd love. Is there a way to see that play? Is it on video format? The play in about Fadu that you did in the um, we we did. We have a video, but we but we never actually edited the play itself. Okay. Um, it was the story. I mean, the the actual stage was you would go inside a big warehouse that was all made of bricks so it looked like you were a bit in Alfama and then we recreated the little um, streets of Alfama oh, so wow. that was the streets of Alfama where you would have people selling in in small uh, kind of kiosk you'd sell custard tarts of uh, chorizo or ginjinha or different things and then you'd go inside a fado house and then you see that the audience could sit in the middle of the stage. So it was more of an interactive kind of um, play. And the actors were the Fado singers. So the, as if they were guests and they would talk with each other in the middle of the, 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 the audience. Mm -hmm. And then they would sing. So the Fado would be related to the story. And of course, the story was always like the girl loves the boy and then the boy doesn't like her. And a typical Fado drama where, oh, he left me, oh, but I love him. And <laughs> but uh, very much of what you hear a bit in the streets of Alfama. But, but yeah, it worked really well. It was really exciting to, um, to show that side. And I think Fado is still, as well, it's still not explored enough to have a, a more of a commercial point of view, you know, instead of, just being like this dramatic and very intense thing. <laughs> this, is always like this, this is always this balance in Portugal of something pure, but you don't want to over, but nobody wants to over exploit it and over commercialize <laughs> it. And this is the challenge that we have in this country. It's, uh, Correct. it's a bit of a fine line. But at, at the same time is the good thing, right? It's, yeah. If yeah, you yeah, 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 hundred percent. You miss it, you lose it. But then like, <laughs> if you go to Father House, and you and you start speaking in the middle of a father they they don't allow you if you're in a, a right one they, they will be very rude to you and, and tell you to shut up and <laughs> in and i have all my friends are from the father world as well and i'm like you don't need to be so rude and they're like no 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 we need to be rude because the tourists cannot be you know cannot yeah. talk during the father and i'm like okay it's part of it it's cultural yeah, uh, I mean, I love that you you said that you wanted to kind of show more of Portugal to the world. This is kind of what the podcast is about, is I felt like there's not enough people who know about Portugal from, from the inside out, uh, because we've got so many beautiful things here that, are, that happen in this country and cultures and and things like that. Um, so, yeah, I love, I love that. Um, was that little 
stint in London kind of the catalyst doing that play was kind of the catalyst to bring you back? Yeah, I mean, um, the fact that I arrived here and, and there wasn't, I've never, I, I couldn't point a big production apart from the house that, what was the name with Marilyn Streep, the, the ghost, uh, Casa dos Fantasmas, um, the, the, a very old film. I need to remember the one, one of the first ones that were shot in Portugal, but years ago. Of Meryl and, Streep? Um, yes. Oh. It was like, uh, yeah, that was the one that everyone was talking about, but not the haunted house, not the something with ghosts. I need to remember. Um, and I knew about that one, but that one was like ages ago. And I, I was impressed on how, like how little the industry, the film industry, Hollywood knew about Portugal. And I start doing a lot of trips to LA and to London and to back to London and, and to other film festivals. And people were very um, unaware of what Portugal had and the kind of the landscapes that had. So I remember some of my first meetings in, in LA about Portugal, they would say, is that a part of of Spain, <laughs> I'm like yeah, no, you know it's it's a whole new it's a whole different country, but obviously at that point we didn't have any incentives, and that changed the whole game. Any fiscal incentives for the film industry, and in two thousand and eight, they came into place, and that was you know crucial for for us to be where we are now. Was it called the House of the Spirits? Yes, that's the one with Jeremy Irons. Yeah, 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 yeah. Maybe exactly. that's why he ended up living here. Probably. He did many other films, I think, and he did other films here. Train to Lisbon and some other things. Correct. Yeah. Right. He yeah. was, um, yeah, he's a big fan. And I think those that come to Portugal and and discover it end up staying here, you know, and end up uh, <laughs> exploring it. <laughs> I know one. <laughs> you know one at least. Yeah, yeah. Not so famous as others, others other people, but 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 yeah, you know one. We do um, have some famous, but they, they the good thing is they man, managed to stay and un, underground, undercovered, let's say. So a lot, there's lots of film producers living here, but they don't necessarily, you know, it's not a country that has a lot of paparazzis or it's not like in Spain. Yeah, yeah I also think there's a there is a culture amongst the Portuguese about discretion, you know, like let's just leave that guy to live his life. I know he's a famous person, but it's a yeah. little bit more discreet. I mean, also, I think um, shyness somehow. Can, can you mm -hmm. say shyness? Is it shyness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, way of, um, yeah, I don't want to bother. You know, I know he's famous, but I'm not going to bother. Whereas you have a Spanish, you're like, ah, they go and they make sure that it's, they know that they are there and you have a picture and you have a, an yeah. autograph. So it's quite yeah. funny to work between the both countries sometimes because we have completely, yeah. like, we're neighbors and we're completely different culturally. Yeah, yeah. That's why it's so annoying when people think that Spain is Portugal or Portugal yeah. is Spain. <laughs> I'm like, like, no, you yeah. couldn't have a, you couldn't have two different types of people in the world, you know. A hundred percent. But I but, feel that happens so much in neighbor countries, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dutch and the Belgians, it's the same. There's there the, there's, there's the connotations and stuff like that. But the Spanish kind of make fun of the Portuguese. Let's make that very clear. <laughs> they still think that we are the poor the poor cousin. That's fine. Let them think that we know the truth. I make a lot of fun of the Spanish on this podcast. I, I make no, no, beef. I get into some trouble <laughs> Me sometimes. Too. I mean, in general, we have to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I mean, um, let's talk about a couple of the projects that you've done. Um, so first, how you and I got in touch was because I'm a, I'm, I'm a, I'm crazy about castles. I love, and Portugal is like a playground for castles we have so many and you don't have to drive far to find one and Absolutely. it's it's incredible and one of my most favorite of all time is Monsanto um and I saw somewhere along through my LinkedIn and things like that you know social media works that um there was these featurettes about shooting more short shooting House of Dragons in Monsanto um yeah. <laughs> how did that start tell us a little bit about that journey what what you're allowed to tell us I don't want to get um, you into trouble. Well, now that the series is out, it's much easier to talk about it. Um, and and as, as I was telling you earlier, there's a lot of the creative parts that unfortunately we don't have a lot of um, 
saying in it, but it's it's really amazing to be part of such a creative team that are, you know, building major sets and travel the world to find these places. And then when they come to your hometown and hometown and they find places like Monsanto and they love it, it's really rewarding, you know, and and you want to be as as parts and as as uh, open and and helpful as much as possible so that's what happened with monsanto the um, the production designer jim clay he's amazing and he's such a nice person he's he he knew about portugal and he has heard about it before so they there was a couple of locations that they were already looking into it like the berlengas you know the the castle of yeah. berlengas so we did uh, in 2000 and oh my god we shot this one 2001 I think in 2019 that's when they came here to Portugal for the first time <laughs> so they did the scout in Spain and then Portugal they saw a couple of these these monuments the the Tower of Belém as well they did and and that was funny because it it was a Monday and they normally close and we're like you have to open this, <laughs> like we need to sell this castle. And the director at the time, she didn't really quite like filming. So she's like, why would I open this? And we're like, because it's House of the Dragons. But at the time, no one cared, you know, it's not Game of Thrones and it's a new series. It's kind of a, a unknown series, but we managed to open it and we saw it. But ultimately what they really enjoyed was, was most central. And once they decide that, that was it, you know, we would have to make it work. But for whoever knows Monsanto, you arrive there and you think, I can't even bring my like little handbag. How can I bring a whole set of crew and equipment? We were about thousands. We were at the time in Monsanto, maybe a bit less, like 700 or 800, but that's kind of the size of the crew that we were. And then it's more than the population of, the, Monsanto, of Monsanto. Yeah. There are 90, there's 90 people exactly. living in the, in the village. And then I remember to go there before everything was confirmed. I just went there with a friend to make sure I knew the right context. And I was like, um, something very big might happen here. Um, <laughs> I don't know how to explain you how big. And they were like, oh, so many people say that, that they want to come here and then they don't. And I'm like, uh, I'm afraid this is <laughs> almost pretty confirmed because they love it. I don't know how we're going to make it work when and uh, <laughs> uh, exactly, you know, the, the, the timings, but this is going to happen. And since then, we were so welcomed in the village you know all i mean all what the, the municipality done for us in the sense of they were um in construction the whole village was in construction and and you know it was really narrow streets tiny streets and um if you have one crane in the middle of a street forget about it no one passes it's like it's one the one <clears throat> the one um exit you have you cannot go any other way but they said they would make sure to finish when we were there and they did you know they changed everything the lamps the streets they really they really helped us wow. but of course that wasn't enough to bring all the the major equipment we had yeah you used the air force <laughs> yes correct um okay. that, that again you know it's so funny to look back and i love that you ask and that you're interested in monsanto because there's so many little details that no one cares you know you you're struggling for a year we're producing this for a year and and like endless nights without sleep and and hard work and then in the end everyone's like oh you know it's bling it happened and why are you crazy i couldn't sleep for days and days and the reality was we arrived there and we had the first meeting with the with the president and he's very open and very straightforward like he loves really doing you, you know, Boom. Boom is in the same... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's near to Danyanova. So he always has this upfront, you know, let's let's make it work, this kind of attitude. And that really helped us. But the first thing, you know, we had a couple of people that are helping us. We said, we need helicopters to bring the, the equipment. And it's a lot of, lot of equipment. It's not like one go. It's We need days in days, which end up being five days of fully helicopter loads which, five days yeah three to take and two to take out <laughs> so full days of back and forth from 7 a.m as soon as you have the sunrise to the sunset which is when the the helicopter can fly 
and we said, I mean, it's not really a job for a private helicopter company because you need to be really precise. So you have the setup of the castle and I really recommend whoever hasn't been there to go and visit the castle. Yeah. Um, it's not like it's plain everywhere. You know, you have a part that it's plain, but then it's rocks and it's it's all. Yeah, it's uh, almost got like three levels to it. You've got the flat for everywhere else around is flat. Then you go upper level. Then you go yeah. up another level and then you go yeah, still another, up another level. It's, it's insane. It's a lot of space. So imagine we're talking about, I don't know, trucks and trucks of grip equipment, of electric mm -hmm. equipment, of costume, of... I mean, each department carries so much equipment in this show like this. So our locations team had to do a plan, a map where you have square meters for each department. So the helicopter had to bring up the, we had to uh, organize all the material in loads and each load had a timing to go up, depending on once you go up needs to be built up there so everything needs to be planned to that detail so the helicopter needs to pick it up and leave it precisely on the little square that each department had so we need we, we had this platform all divided <laughs> and equipment like generators they, once they are up there you cannot move them because they're really heavy and yeah. there's not man enough to move a generator from one rock to the other so they need to really be precise so a private company doesn't do this kind of jobs, only the Air Force. So we said we need the Air Force and the Air Force does help in Spain, but not in Portugal normally. It's not, it's not common that, that film crews go and ask the help to the Air Force. And they told us like, forget about the Air Force, we'll never do that for you. I mean, it's completely crazy or crazy. And we're like, we're not going to give up <laughs> and we're going to insist and we're going to try and we're going to call and we're going to be a pain in the ass. Sorry, beep, <laughs> but this no, is okay. what we are. <laughs> As producers, that's what you have to do and that's what you have to, can never give up. And, and no is not an answer. Like, no, it's not an option. We know it's a guarantee, but it's not the option. So you have to continue to insist. And, and we did, and we managed to get the helicopters and the Amazing. services, and they were awesome. And it was really reward, rewarding. Amazing. Um... What was the reaction of, of the, the, you know, the, the, the crew, the actors of, about this place? Because the few things that I've heard, they were blown away by this, this location. I've been there, so I know why. But um, what was the reaction of the people that, that came there for the first time? Um, being totally honest, creatively, um, they loved it. Anyone that's <laughs> part of the creative team loves anyone that it's part of the technical crew is like what <laughs> I have to go up all of this with my gear and back and forth so I think logistically they complain a little bit but then being up there is amazing and it's like a feeling that being able to be shooting something and and really feel the, the sense of the, the, the series, it's amazing because it's Dragonstone. So you really feel that you're in a Dragonstone, I don't know, the land yeah. of dragons, basically. Yeah, I mean, it could be. It's so high up. It is, it is, yeah. I wonder if we ever had dragons in Portugal. I'm sure we had, but don't tell that to anyone. <laughs> I think I saw some eggs there. <laughs> um these people that lived in in monsanto the 90 people i mean they're used to having this place except for a little bit in the summer all to themselves nice and quiet uh how did i mean then and then all of a sudden 700 people helicopters how, how did that go you know and and you know film crew is never quiet the film crew is no, like this this kind of people that there's even this short film that it's kind of one guy that goes knocks at a girl's like a, the lady's house can I come in? I just need to look into your window and do, oh, no, sure, sure. One comes in. Second time, excuse me, can I just need to actually put something on top? And then third, fourth. And, and by this point, you have 10 people in your house changing the curtains, changing the lights, changing. Oh, it's just this. So that's a film crew. So now imagine 700 people in that little village is literally cars going back and forth, everyone with like fluorescent vests, shouting police, come, go, no, excuse me, can I use a toilet? Can I, you know, it's like, we're so loud, and we're so intense. 
but I think they enjoyed it because it was fun. And I think everyone was, everyone co-lived very well. Amazing, amazing. And Fast and the Furious, I mean, I know it's not out yet, so we have to be careful what we talk about. Where was it actually shot? Well, we've, we've been in a couple of places in, in Portugal, um, all over, but mainly we were in, um, in the highway between Vila Real and Viseu, the A24. Okay. So it's right in the middle and it's beautiful because it's Doru uh, and it's where you catch all the vineyards and you can see a lot. I mean, initially that wasn't exactly what they were going for, the, the, the kind of a beautiful landscape, but let's see how it, how it ends up. I'm curious. How it looks, how how it really looks the end product. Very curious. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um, you know, let's let's just talk about Monsanto, like <laughs> just to give it a bit more time. I mean, what? How would you describe it to somebody, and what would you want them to know about this special place? Well, I think you need to get there to have the feeling of the energy. So many places are like that. Um, and, and especially in Portugal, you have a lot of places unexplored that you arrive and you feel a sense of an energy, something more powerful than you what you can describe in a picture. So I recommend, Monsanto is one of these places that you need to be there to understand it and to feel and then to see the view. I've been there so many like different with different weathers and all of them are special if it's if it's a bit cloudy and foggy you really feel a sense of mystery and in a sense of the old times it looks like you stopped in time and then if it's sunny you see a major landscape that you can see for miles and miles and and you really wonder because it's it, it was made of um from the um, ah, how do you call the old uh, religious ah, i'm say it in portuguese it's okay uh, no i can't remember oh. um, uh, that's pregnancy brain. Yeah, pregnancy brain is terrible. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. I, I just have plantarius. <laughs> it's not plantarius. It's um, like the old soldiers from, from religion, really old. The Knights Templars. Yeah, it was Templarius. But it was, I was there. <laughs> plantarius. You were close. Templarius. You were close. Because I have a big uh, um, planet here, <laughs> like plantarius. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the templates, Templarius. Um, that built that um, ages ago. And you think, how were they able to carry those massive rocks? I mean, the, the story of Monsanto is really that there was an eruption that didn't burst. So you have these shaped rocks that were uh, formed. So it pushed the rocks up, but it didn't explode. Yeah, correct. Mm -hmm. So that's why they have this major shape. But obviously, um, Ustemplarius then built the castle on top of that. So they yeah. had to bring all these huge rocks, like huge. And you wonder how did they do that? Like, no helicopters. No, no helicopters. No. So I mean, Crazy. we complain these days about oh, I don't have my car to go around the corner. It's like, yeah. I think yeah. we should all live for a moment, you know, three centuries ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. How and how does it work? Do you, do you, do do these companies come to you and say this is what we're trying to film? We're thinking about this as a location and you do the, the, the sourcing? The logistics, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Basically, that's how it happens. Uh, they come, they come with, um, with the creativity, with the scripts. A lot of these big shows already have some heads of department. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. Like um, the costume designer or the production manager. They come from there because they already have to, to keep the same line of design throughout the whole show. So we are just a sort of a unit. In this case, we were blood unit. And so there was fire unit and blood unit. Fire unit was shooting in the UK. Blood unit was import, uh, traveling. It's the traveling unit. And, and so we need to put it all together. So we hire the people that, that they need. You know, we need to um, match what they have to what we need here and then source everything as much locally as possible because trying not to export too much, especially now from the UK has been really complicated to bring anything. And then it's logistics. Yeah. And Thanks a lot, Brexit. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, for you, you know, I'm sure you've traveled quite a bit around Portugal. I mean, where else do you think would be a, a great place to shoot something like this epic? Um, oh, there's so many that places. You'd love to, well, it's a place that you'd love to. It's pretty crazy because um, now, even though they're not the same genre, Fast and Furious and House of, Dra uh, House of the Dragon, with Fast and Furious, we traveled the whole country. I think we were like for three or four months just scouting Wow. And looking, even though, the, the again, the brief was completely different. It was more like industrial kind of warehouses yeah. or abandoned places. You end up meeting the country much better. So we, we've explored all the Serra de Estrela in Jerez and all the, the, the north interior that it's not so explored. And of course, Douro has a beauty that, you know, there's a lot of places up there that have... Um, historical um how do you say the <laughs> to to find skeletons that you don't know uh the the archaeology and things yeah like archaeology that. Yeah. <laughs> i need to think about having a pregnant woman on the podcast again i don't know i don't know if it's such a <laughs> idea I should have here yeah, like a dictionary to to just remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I'm even worse, you know. I forget names of people that I know very well. So I hope he's very intelligent, Oliver, because he's stealing all my brain for now. <laughs> but but yeah, so we did a whole like scouting a lot, and there's a lot of places that haven't been explored at all, and castles as well. I mean, so many abandoned castles out there that could that could do so many things, but, you know, this process of scouting and location finding, it's really creative and, and we receive a script and we read it and then we have to do a whole folder of locations on what we think it could work. And there's all sorts of briefs, you know, all sorts of different requirements. Now, now we received one that we need to find like an old hospital, sort of abandoned hospital, but that the interior needs to be the certain kind of period and then the exterior cannot be too grand. So, you know, it's even film, that's the beauty of film and, and TV and not so much commercials because commercials are a bit more beauty and film and TV, you end up being a bit more storytelling. And so many times these locations are just related to the story and they don't have to be beautiful. They don't have to look grand or they don't have to look... They just need to fit what we're looking for for mm -hmm. the story. So it's it's a very creative process, I have to say. Caldas de Reina for your hospital. Yeah, it's yeah, yeah. an yeah. abandoned thing and it's pretty as well. And they, I know they're not saying grand, but it's amazing, that building. I, I That was one of my first choices. And it's like I say that they weren't looking for something so grand. So it's like, but you want to sell the location. It's so beautiful. Yeah. And they're like, yeah. yeah, but that's too beautiful. So it's kind of uh, the fine line between what we're looking for and what really sells and what do they need. So it's, yeah, yeah. there's never right or wrong. Um, when you, now that, I mean, you've been going around the country and you're looking at things with a different eye, uh, literally, um, what are, what are the things that you appreciate about Portugal, um, since you've been going around and looking at all these different sites? I think one of the, the first, um, impressions that anyone that that's been going on these calls with me is that. Mostly everyone, again, is very welcoming to this idea of filming. So it's very rare, like we had the situation with the Tower of Belém, that people go, I don't like filming or I don't want, don't want TV or, or cinema or whatever. So the first reaction is we're welcome to open the doors. We're interested in exploring that. I think this is going to be good for our, for our area, like the... the the highway, for instance, I know we were talking about a location that it seems easy, but it's one of the most complicated locations to secure on a, on a film set, especially for so long and for in such a stretch of, uh, of highway. I don't think you could do this in Europe anywhere else, anywhere else. And you can ask anyone that it's, you know, specialized in this area of locations and they would say the same. Normally, you can close a highway fits in construction, not a moving highway. And that's what we had 
And the whole reason was because we were very welcomed from the first, the first uh, call we had. So the concessionary said, look, we don't know if this can, if this is possible with the government, you know, there's a lot of logistics to get there and, and bu bureaucracies that need to go through, but we are open to help you and we'd love this to, to happen in our highway. So that was the only reason why we managed to get Fast and Furious here. Yeah, so the people make it really easy. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, seeing seeing your country through the eyes of all these different people coming from all over the world, um, what makes you proud of of Portugal, Sofia? Um, the humility. Humility. Like, yeah. Yeah, I think you know people are humble here, and even though it's pretty and we have great things to offer we're not like this is the best and this is what you have it's like it's always like this is really nice but you know we understand that there might be other places as beautiful <laughs> but don't say anything bad about it <laughs> no you can't, the, you can't leave them not even if it's Vin Diesel we like you no. don't say that buddy yeah exactly. <laughs> listen <laughs> I think you need to come, you need to, you need to do, get something for Abidos Castle. Have you been to Abidos Castle? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I spent all my holiday, all my childhood in Abidos. Really? Yeah. That's and, my, that's uh, my hometown. Wow. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, the, the one thing with Abidos is that the one thing that I would say that I would ask people to stop in Portugal is to not, um, rebuild everything too pretty you know and and i'm afraid if obedus goes way too pretty and too clean because what makes the roughness at least for my industry and i might be a bit selfish here but it's the authenticity and so many things are i understand for the i mean for the residents might be good but for the authenticity of a place we might destroy it you're the first guest on the podcast that said that we don't want Portugal to be too pretty, you know? So that's a, that's a first. I like it. Yeah, but I mean, you know, I, I tell you, for example, Marvila in Lisbon. Yeah. Um, it's an up-and-coming kind of uh, area. But before, there was a lot of more, like, unexplored areas that looked amazing and rough. And now scouting for Fast and Furious, we couldn't we couldn't film anywhere there because it was they were looking new and and just general, you know, um, not general, but just same as everywhere else. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sophia, you mentioned spending so much time um, being overseas uh, in LA and 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 London. What were some of those things? What are some of the things that you missed about about being in Portugal? Um, definitely the food. When I when I moved to LA, I stopped eating meat, not because it was, you know, <laughs> LA mo uh, fashion, but just because I the, the food there wasn't so, you know, so real. Whereas here, I don't mind eating meat because it feels like I know where it's coming from and I know it's not so industrial. Um, same with fish and with fruit for sure. And I hope it stays the same. But also this this um, slow pace that you know everything will be fine. Not too ambitious sometimes, which is good because it gives you some some sort of peace. I'm not like that naturally, so I, I'm very ambitious <laughs> and I work a lot. So when I'm here, I feel a bit more relaxed and a little bit more um, in peace with myself. So it's yeah. good to to be back and forth. You know, I need to get out as well. That's the one thing yeah. I'm not gonna lie. It's good to get out and 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 have a little feed off this energy from other big capitals, but it's good to come back to realize that life, it's not only about working and thriving. Yeah. Portugal gives you rest. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. I hope We're it gonna... gives you for Oliver as well. <laughs> for sure. I, I, I it's gonna give, have to give you more rest from Oliver, you know, because <laughs> it's a whole other correct. level now. No, no, hold on the level. Um, Sophia, what's what's one thing that you would like people to remember and take away from our conversation? 
Just one thing. One thing, oh my God, is to visit Portugal, but to appreciate it slowly and not in this crazy globalization way of doing things. So I love that. Visit Portugal, but appreciate it slowly. That's awesome. Oh, it looks like it was good. <laughs> we need to trademark that. We need to trademark it right now. Do you know someone who can do that? Okay. Um, so we, how can people follow you online, be kept up to date with your work? Oh my God, and stay in follow touch? me on Instagram. No, I, I tell you, I, I had a private Instagram, but with all of this, I open it and it's, I'm very nervous about it because I don't think I post things interesting. It's just like me. Who wants to see me? So I'm going to start making more interesting posts, I think. But my Instagram is Sofia underscore Noronha. Please follow me. And my production company is Sages. Oh, God. And Sages underscore productions. I think that's it. Okay. So Instagram is the place to go for. for, Instagram. I mean, we have a website, but, you know, Instagram now is the 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 one for, for now, for now. So you you promising me lots of followers now that we everyone's losing followers? <laughs> I think I think you might get some followers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god! <laughs> At least you. I hope you follow me. I do. I do. That's how I knew that you were pregnant. Oh, <laughs> before before you told me, um, Sophia. This has been so much fun. Um, a question that we ask all of our guests: Portugal, the simple life. Why? The appreciation of the good things that life has. Does that make sense? Is that yeah, yeah, makes the sun, sense to me. food, and people. Yeah, makes perfect sense. <laughs> that wasn't as good then. <laughs> this was a wonderful conversation thank you uh, thank good you luck with so the much. pregnancy um really and, thank you uh, for inviting me it was a pleasure i hope i haven't you. talked too much that's the whole point of a podcast is to <laughs> talk so we're good you're good um <laughs> look for, i look forward to seeing more of what you've got coming up in the future and uh, good luck with everything maybe we'll meet yeah soon. that'll be that'll be nice that'll be nice yeah. um sophia for now i'm gonna let you call it And that's a wrap. (laughs) So thank you once again to Sophia. And thank you to all of you for listening. Please subscribe, share with your friends, give us a thumbs up, and please leave a comment or a review. We always love to hear from you. Don't forget, Portugal The Simple Life also has a magazine. So download it. It's for free. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. And as we say in Portugal, um abraço. Welcome to the simple.